dear students welcome to the class and in this class as i told you i will talk about two poems two poems by nisa musical um, that is a morning walk and hymns in darkness but first let me read and analyze the first poem that is a morning walk then i will go to the other poem that is hymns in darkness first a morning walk now i will first read the poem then i will go into the analysis now as you can see on the slide the poem is there now let me read first a morning walk driven from his bed by troubled sleep in which he dreamt of being lost upon a hill too high for him a modest hill whose sides grew too steep he stood where several highways crossed and saw the city cold and dim her only human hands sail cheap it was an old recurring dream that made him pause upon a height alone he waited for the sun and felt his blood a sluggish stream why had it given him no light his native place he could not sun the mars where things are what they seem barbaric city sick with slums deprived of seasons blessed with rains its hawkers beggars iron lunged processions led by frantic drums a million purgatorial lanes and child like masses many tongued whose wages are in words and in and crumbs he turned away the morning breeze released no secrets to his ears the more he stared the less he saw among the individual trees the middle of his journey nears is he among the men of straw who think they go which way they please returning to his dream he knew that everything would be the same constricting as his formal dress the pain of his fragmented view too late and small his insights came and now his memory is oppress his will is like the morning dew the garden on the hill is cool its hedges cut to look like birds or mythic beasts are still asleep his past like a muddy pool from which he cannot hope for words the city wakes her fame is cheap and he belongs an active fool so this is the whole poem mm. this is the whole poem and let me try and analyze the poem stanza by stanza now as you can see the poem is taken from the unfinished man which was published in 1960 from the writers workshop kolkata it was then called calcutta this is also first of the two writers workshop publications that is the unfinished man as i told you in my last video lecture that ezekiel has to his credit the volume is known to contain poems which are commonly labeled as city poems the volume that is the unfinished man now this a morning walk which is also taken from the unfinished man is as some critics have held a city poem or a metrospective poem and i and i have already uh, analyzed what metrospective poem means the the poem begins with a troubled sleep where the dream is that of being lost see the first two lines driven from his bed by troubled sleep in which he dreamed of being lost which means he didn't have control over his sleep sleep which is supposed to be the most peaceful of acts that 
human beings can do or any animals can do or can have. So, even in complete peaceful condition, the man does not have peace. The hill which poses problem is not too high or too problematic. You, may, you can interpret too high as too problematic or too much of a problem. Yet the man is having trouble. See, the hill is described as a modest hill whose sides grew too steep. So how can a modest hill pose problems for a man? So the problem is emanating not from inside of his existence or the core of his existence but it's a problem of society which does not allow a person to sleep peacefully the city lies in front of him as a cold and dim see uh, in the in, in that line and saw the city cold and dim where human hands sell cheap materials the fact of being cold and dim may mean the city being heartless and the city also being void of any passion of flame of life. The same kind of description continues in the second stanza where it is stated it was an old recurring dream that made him pause upon a height alone he waited for the sun. So, even the sunlight fails to infuse light and power into him because he is so pitted against or submerged into the doom as the dream frequently occurs to him. As it is stated in the first line, it is an old recurring dream. So it's not that the dream is occurring to him very newly. It's an old dream. It occurs to him very frequently. The dream of being lost. The, pan, the, the poet feels that he has lost himself somewhere. But the irony lies in the fact that he cannot avoid the place. The place which offers no soothing experience of his existence cannot be avoided. Because it's, a, it's his native place. And how, he, uh, how has he described his place? See, very famous line. Barbaric city seek with slum. If you see the next stanza, the first line, barbaric city seek with slums, and the city is deprived of seasons but blessed with rains. The poem, that's why, is very often hailed as one of the city poems of Ezekiel or a metrospective poem, as I told you. The first vision, the, I mean, sorry, the poet's vision then falls on to the mundane affairs of life. The hawkers, the beggars, iron-lunged processions, which are led by drums, drums which are frantic, which are described as frantic, who are passing through lanes and streets which are purgatorial. Now, this purgatorial, as it is stated here, uh, this purgatorial may remind one of certain half deserted streets in Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufock. And I hope you have read this poem or at least you know about this poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufock, one of the modern poems written by T.S. Eliot. The description and depiction that is borders on being borders on being Dantian and the modern man seems to pass through hellish city. Uh, the pessimistic tone and note continues in, in into the next stanza as the morning breezes whispers no secrets to his ears. See, he turned away, the morning breeze released no secrets to his ears. So there is no secret, uh, I mean, that one can wait for right in, during the morning and the observation adds to the blindness his vision gets blurred metaphorically as he comes near to the middle of his journey the underlying irony is played out the more he traverses his path the more his vision gets blurred see the more he stared the less he saw among the individual trees that means the more he traverses his 
way, the more he traverses, traverses his path, the more his vision gets blurred, it seems. The straw man which bears an, uh, bears an oblique reference to Eliot's proof of again is absolutely void of any meaningful substance. The middle of his journey nears, if you look at the stanza, is, among, is he among the men of straw? A men of straw stand for, stand for men having no substance. Uh, uh, words having no substance, having no meaning. Who think they go which way they please? So, going which way they please in the last line or in this line may also suggest that they are without any direction and destination. So, the man is absolutely lost. The man on his middle of his journey is directionless, is having no destination. This, this motif, this theme, uh, that is the man is lost without, uh, the man is directionless, the man is having no destination, is again will be found in his uh, hymns in darkness, although in different circumstances. But I will talk about that later on. Come back to the text. So thus, the poet uh, uses dream as a motive. The poem goes through a series of descriptive passages where the tone of modernity is very much apparent. There is no hope, no optimism, hence his declaration returning to his dream he knew that everything would be the same. The first line of the next stanza. Returning to his dream he knew that everything would be the same. He would be constricted and restricted as he won't get a comprehensive view of city and life lying in front of him. See the lines, constricting as his formal dress, the pain of his fragmented view. See as, there is a metaphor here, as formal dress, as, as a gentleman wears formal dress, he looks from external point of view very gorgeous, very good, but perhaps inwardly that gentleman feels constricted and restricted. He doesn't have that freedom wearing that formal dress. Similar metaphor is played out here. He would be constricted and restricted as he won't get a comprehensive view of city and life lying in front of him. He is so tiny, so little and so insignificant that his vision does not matter. And as he cannot find any need to have his memory stored. That's why Memory oppresses him and his will, which has a humbugging exist existence in normal condition, has become as insignificant as a dewdrop on a grass blade. See, too late and small his insights came and now his memories oppress. His will is like the morning dew. That means his will is or has become as insignificant, as transient as the morning dew on a grass blade. The morning dew is commonly associated with uh, something mm, very beautiful, uh, something very hopeful, but here the image of a morning dew is applied differently. That's why Ezekiel is also known as a modern poet because he uses images uh, quite differently and here is an example. Now his memory oppress, memories oppress, memories of living in a city life, memories of having spent considerable amount of time in a city which doesn't have anything new to offer him is, 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 is very oppressing. The memory is very oppressing. That's why he says that his will is like the morning dew, as evanescent, as transient, as fragile as a morning dew on a grass blade. Now the last stanza, the garden on the hill is cool. The man, I mean the man ultimately emerges as, as a modern active fool. When being hopeful of communication is tantamount to being hopeless. See? It's hedges, I mean, he's passed like a muddy pool from which he cannot hope for words. The city wakes where the fame is cheap and he belongs an active fool. 
although there remains garden on the hilltop i mean it's it's described here and the garden on the hilltop uh, on the hill its hedges cut to look like birds or mythic beasts um, uh, uh, so there are descriptions of garden on the hilltop and cool bridges blow with structures of hedges cut like birds or mythic beasts beasts but the city does not offer any glorious fame one might get fame but the, that fame is also so cheap and less significant so the city perhaps might offer some beautiful sites sites in the garden uh, sites in the surrounding but the, those sites those scenes are no soothing experiences because his past uh, a city dweller's past remains like a muddy pool a chaotic pool a chaotic uh, conglomeration from which he cannot hope for words from which he cannot have any optimism whatsoever of meaning the city wakes the people in the city wake wake up in the morning but they find that the fame is so cheap even if they run after fame even if they hanker after fame they find that fame is so cheap and the city dweller ultimately belongs or emerges to be an active fool so this is how the poem ends i mean the poem the poem's tone gets modern as it seems to afford some of the modern man's concern to society and his surrounding and in this concern the poem may remind one of the poems of t s eliot who expressed same sort of concern of the modern man's plight and ordeal structurally speaking also if you analyze the poem structurally the poem comprises six stanzas in each slide you ha you'll have two stanza uh, two stanzas each uh, but the whole poem comprises six stanzas each consisting of seven lines you can have you can you can read it uh, you can look at it there are seven lines in each stanza where the first three lines rhyme with the next three see take the example of the last stanza the garden on the hill is cool its hedges cut to look like birds or mythic beasts are like asleep these three lines rhyme with the next three lines his past like a muddy pool cool pool from which he cannot hope for words birds words the city wakes where fame is cheap asleep cheap and the last line becomes of unique rhyme scheme and he belongs an active fool this same pattern continues is maintained in the whole poem now this is uh, the sort of analysis uh, that i can offer to you uh, if you have questions if you have anything uh, you may you may have different observation you may have different interpretation of the poem uh, you can put across you can you can you can let me know via email or over telephone so with that let uh, let me go to the analysis of the next poem that is hymns in darkness and you will find the analysis of this poem in the next in the next video